Good afternoon. <clears throat> what happened in the Middle East? After 13 years of civil war in Syria, more than half a century of brutal authoritarian rule by Bashir Assad and his father before him, rebel forces have forced Assad to resign his office and flee the country. We're not sure where he is, but there's word that he's in Moscow. At long last, the Assad regime has fallen. This regime brutalized and tortured and killed literally hundreds of thousands of innocent Syrians. The fall of the regime is a fundamental act of justice. It's a moment of historic opportunity for the long-suffering people of Syria to build a better future for their proud country. It's also a moment of risk and uncertainty. As we all turn to the question of what comes next, the United States will work with our partners and the stakeholders in Syria to help them seize an opportunity to manage the risks. You know, for years, the main backers of Assad have been Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia. But over the last week, their support collapsed, all three of them, because all three of them are far weaker today than they were when I took office. And let's remember why. After Hamas attacked Israel on October the 7th, 2023, when much of the world responded with horror, Iran and its proxies chose to launch a multi-front war against Israel. That was a historic mistake on Iran's part. Today, Iran's main territorial proxy, Hezbollah, is also on its back. <clears throat> Only 12 days ago, I spoke from the Rose Garden about the ceasefire deal in Lebanon a deal that was only possible because Hezbollah has been badly degraded. Meanwhile, Hamas has been da badly degraded as well. Iran's own military capabilities have been weakened. Iran tried two times to attack Israel in the United States and built a coalition of countries to directly defend Israel and help defeat those attacks. All this made possible for Iran and Hezbollah to continue to prop up is impossible, I should say, for them to prop up the Assad regime. Additionally, Russia's support for Assad also failed. And that's because Ukraine, backed by our American allies, has put up a wall of resistance against the invading Russian forces, inflicting massive damage on the Russian forces. And that has left Russia unable to protect its main ally in the Middle East. <clears throat> Excuse my cold. The upshot for all this is for the first time ever, neither Russia nor Iran nor Hezbollah could defend this abhorrent regime in Syria. And this is a direct result of the blows that Ukraine, Israel, have delivered upon their own self-defense with unflagging support of the United States. You know, over the past four years, my administration pursued a clear principled policy towards Syria. First, we made clear from the start <clears throat> sanction on, on Assad would remain in place unless he engaged seriously in a political process to end the civil war, as outlined by the UN Security Council resolution passed in 2015. But Assad refused, so we carried out a comprehensive sanction program against him and all those responsible for atrocities against the Syrian people. Second, we maintained our military presence in Syria, our counter-ISIS to counter the support of local partners as well on the ground their partners, never ceding an inch of territory, taking out leaders of ISIS, ensuring that ISIS can never establish a safe haven there again. Third, we've supported Israel's freedom of action against the reigning networks in Syria and against actors aligned with Iran who transported lethal aid to Lebanon. And when necessary, I ordered the use of military force against Iranian networks to protect U.S. forces. Our approach has shifted the balance of power in the Middle East through this combination of support for our partners, sanctions, and diplomacy, and targeted military force when necessary. We now see new opportunities opening up for the people of Syria and for the entire region. Looking ahead, the United States will do the following. First, we'll support Syria's neighbors, including Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Israel, should any threat arise from Syria during this period of transition. I will speak with leaders of the region in the coming days. I had a long discussion with all of our people earlier this morning. And I'll send senior officials from my administration to the region as well. 
Second, we will help stability, ensure stability in eastern Syria, protecting any personnel, our personnel, against any threats, and will remain our mission against ISIS will be maintained, including the security of detention facilities where ISIS fighters are being held as prisoners. We're clear-eyed about the fact that ISIS will try to take advantage of any vacuum to reestablish its capabilities and to create a safe haven. We will not let that happen. In fact, just today, <coughs> U.S. forces conducted a dozen of precision strikes, airstrikes, within Syria, targeting ISIS camps and ISIS operatives. Third, we will engage with all Syrian groups, including within the process led by the United Nations, to establish a transition away from the Assad regime toward independent sovereign — an independent — independent, I might say it again — sovereign Syria, with a new constitution, a new government that serves all Syrians. And this process will be determined by the Syrian people themselves. And the United States will do whatever we can to support them, including through humanitarian relief to help restore Syria after more than a decade of war and generations of brutality by the Assad family. And finally, we will remain vigilant. Make no mistake, some of the rebel groups that took down Assad have their own grim record of terrorism and human, human rights abuses. We've taken note of statements by the leaders of these rebel groups in recent days, and we're, they're saying the right things now. But as they take on greater responsibility, we will assess not just their words, but their actions. And we are mindful, we are mindful that there are Americans in Syria, including those who reside there, as well as Austin Tice, who was taken captive more than 12 years ago. We remain committed to returning him to his family. As I've said, this is a moment of considerable risk and uncertainty. <clears throat> but I also believe this is the best opportunity in generations for Syrians to forge their own future, free of opposition. It's also an opportunity through far from certain, though it's far from certain, for a more secure and prosperous Middle East, where our friends are safe, where enemies are contained. And it would be a waste of this historic opportunity if one tyrant were toppled and only, only to see a new one rise up in its place. So it's now incumbent upon all the opposition groups to seek a role in governing Syria, to demonstrate their commitment to the rights of all Syrians, the rule of law, and the protection of religious and ethnic minorities. These past few days have been historic. And, you know, uh, it's in the days ahead that will determine the future of this country. And we intend to approach them with strength, wisdom, and resolve. Thank you very much. God bless America, and God protect our troops. Thank you. What should happen to Assad now, Mr. President? Mr. President, what is the US US know know about about Austin 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 what does the U.S. know about where Austin Tice might be and if he's safe? We believe he's alive. We think we can get him back, but we have no direct evidence of that yet. And Assad should be held accountable. Have you directed an operation to go get him, Mr. Mr. President? Is Assad in Austin? Get who? Austin Tice. We, have to, we won't want to get him out. Yes, sir. We have to identify where he is. 